This is going to be a short overview of complement. And then before I start, I want to remind you that when antibody interacts with antigen, we can consider that there are two steps to the binding. Step one is the actual fact of antibody binding to something. That can have influences on whatever the antigen is, independent of any other secondary uh, events. We'll talk about that in just a second. Or we can go on to step two, where something else happens and the one we're going to talk about today is where complement complements the activity of antibody. In the case uh, that we're talking about right now, the antibody binding, of course, is dependent on FAB, uh, FAB2, um, part of the antibody. It's the specificity part. The complement binding is going to be dependent on the FC part of the antibody. And just to uh, make that point a little more specific, uh, here is a box of um, horse, it says equine, um, anti-venom, anti-snake venom uh, serum. And notice what it says on the box, that it's enzyme, here we are, enzyme refined. Um, enzyme refined means that the antibodies that the horse made were treated with a... Um, uh, an enzyme, probably pepsin, that removes the FC end of the antibody, leaving uh, just the FAB2, which has the, of course, the specificity to bind antigen. And just binding the toxin neutralizes the toxin. You don't need any activity uh, after that, for example, complement activity or opsonization or something like that. Okay, so let's go back now to complement. This diagram shows the three uh, pathways for activating uh, the complement cascade. Uh, the classical pathway is called that because it's been known for much longer than the other ones. I want to uh, briefly talk about the other two pathways and then we won't talk about them anymore. Um, the lectin pathway depends on a uh, protein that we make called mannose binding lectin. Mannose is part of the, um, the surface of a lot of uh, bacteria. So uh, when there are mannose sugars there, MBL can bind to them, and that, through the uh, interaction of, of, with other intermediates, results in a complex that can activate C3, making uh, the rest of the cascade um, uh, activated. Okay. So because this is an interaction between bacteria and MBL, this is uh, doesn't involve the adaptive immune response. So this is an example of innate uh, defense. Um, similarly, over in the alternative pathway, the most common way that it gets activated is when um, a bacterium interacts with certain components of the alternative uh, pathway, factors P, B, D, uh, which serve to stabilize C3. So C3 is always becoming a little bit activated in the body. And uh, normally then it's inactivated, it has a short half-life, but P, B, and D serve to stabilize C3 so it at last long enough to activate C5 and get the rest of the um, cascade going. So again, since in this case, no um, innate, uh, I'm sorry, no adaptive immune uh, uh, products are involved, this is also an innate way of, in of activating complement, uh, which is nice. It means that we can still deal with bacteria even in if we don't uh, have antibody against that particular organism, either because we can't make it or we haven't made it yet. So in the classical pathway, which is the one that uh, involves antibody, um, how does it work? So we have antibody here. This is a, a pathogen of some sort, let's say a bacterium. Um, Antibody has bound to it. Here's a couple of um, IgGs. We'll talk more about the details of that in a moment. Uh, interacts with the first complement uh, component in the classical pathway, which is C1Q. Uh, there's obviously an R and an S and so on, uh, but C1Q is what we need to think about. C1Q, when, once activated, activates the next uh, um, component in the pathway, which happens to be C4. C4, as is typical of some of the components, C4, when activated, splits into a 4B and a 4A component. And in general, in these cases, the B components adhere to the um, 
to the nearest membrane, which would be the bacterium, whereas the A component can diffuse away and have biological activity that way. So quickly, one uh, triggers four, triggers two, triggers three, triggers five, six, seven, Eight, nine. And this last bit down here is called the membrane attack complex. And on the way to it, we generate not just C4A, but C3A and C5A. And those are all have biological activities that um, are important for our understanding of complement. And then finally, going all the way up to C9 has another biological property that we'll discuss. Okay. So C1Q is a most extraordinary looking molecule. Uh, this is an electron microscopic uh, rendering of it. Uh, the most obvious thing are these uh, stalks with the bulbs on the end, which is very much like a, uh, a, uh, a beautiful bouquet of tulips. Uh, there are six of these, and this allows uh, C1Q to bind very efficiently to the FC end of IgG, uh, which of course is what it's designed to do. It can also bind the FC end of IgM. Um, let's see how that works. So here is a bacterium, and uh, let's imagine that uh, it's very early in the immune response, say, and uh, we've made some IgM, and uh, a molecule of IgM has bound uh, an epitope on the surface of the bacterium right now. Now, remembering IgM is decavalent, theoretically, or actually, um, but it's, it's enough if only one of its 10 possible Fs, uh, um, FABs binds the antigen. That causes some kind of change in all the FCs. How that works is not, not understood. Uh, maybe it's not all the FCs, but it's enough FCs to now make uh, the IgM interactive with the first component of complement. And the important thing uh, to know about C1Q is it must react with at least two FCs simultaneously. Um, now, IgM has five FCs, and that makes IgM the most efficient antibody at interacting with a uh, complement that we have. And what happens is... Uh, C1Q can bind to uh, the IgM that has interacted with antigen in such a way that it becomes active and can now um, interact with the uh, rest of the complement cascade. But when, so it takes a, a single molecule of IgM to activate complement this, this way. But um, if we go over to um, an IgG, one IgG binding doesn't present two FCs simultaneously. So what happens? So more IgG is being made, let's say. Next one binds here. Um, still, they're not close enough to interact simultaneously with one uh, um, C1Q. Next one binds here, let's say. Next one binds here. You can see where I'm going with this, that you have to statistically get two uh, IgG is close enough together so that um, so that uh, one uh, C1Q can uh, bridge two FCs and become activated. And the the numbers in experiments that have been done to show this that it uh, you need about oops, sorry you need about 500 IgGs. Uh, to equal the complement activating um, uh, ability of one IgM. So this explains uh, why, I think it explains, but, uh, why when you uh, first get immunized, you make IgM, and that doesn't persist so long because you switch over to IgG. And IgM comes first, partly that's the way um, 
the cell is arranged to do it, but IgM doesn't persist because, as you know, it's too big a molecule to be really good at getting into the tissues and, and, uh, and providing uh, that kind of pre um, protection. It works primarily in the, uh, in the blood uh, stream. But IgG can get out. You need more of it, but you can tolerate more of it because the smaller molecule doesn't make for a viscous solution the way IgM would be. So it's very nice to start with IgM and then be able to switch over to IgG. Okay, so what are the properties that are uh, generated during uh, the activation of complement? Well, these are the four as we listed. Unfortunately, the names are not always uh, self-evident, so let's quickly go through it. Uh, so the first thing we might think about is chemotaxis. So the A components, the early A components, C4A, C3A, C5A, especially C5A, um, are strongly chemotactic for uh, poly, polymorphonuclear neutrophils. So polymorphonuclear sorry, polymorphonuclear neutrophils arrive in large numbers at the site where complement is being activated. When you see enormous numbers of polys all in the same place at the same time, what's that called? Right, pus. Okay, and pus is good, of course. Pus is very good. Okay, so um, the first thing then is we attract lots and lots of polys. When the polys get there, um, what we find on the surface of this bug is, of course, we know there's antibody. Uh, and I'm just drawing it like this. This would be IgG antibody bound to it. And um, remember we said the C, the A components tend to um, diffuse away, but the B components stick to the nearest membrane. So we also have C3B on the membrane. And as the poly with its wiggly nucleus. As it approaches, it um, reveals to us that it has receptors on its surface, both for uh, the FCNs of, of IgG, if the IgG is bound, so there's some sort of change in the FCN. Uh, it can recognize FC, and it can also recognize C3B with receptors. So we would call those a C3B receptor and an FC gamma receptor. Okay? And because it has that, it allows it to firmly grab hold of the bacterium. And because these are all around the surface, uh, it gradually engulfs the bacterium. Remember, it's much bigger than the bacterium. This isn't to scale. Uh, it, it gradually flows around until the bug is inside and then the bug is finished. Okay, So that second uh, effect, this ability, uh, once the poly has been attracted, to uh, provide molecular handles so that the poly can grab it, is called opsonizing from an old Greek word that means to prepare dinner, basically. Uh, so it efficiently allows the poly to grab the bug and get it in with because of it, it, these serve as molecular handles. Um, the other property we want to talk about, the one that's hardest to remember, is called anaphylatoxic. Obviously a very old word uh, relating to, in some experiment, there must have been anaphylaxis, the extreme uh, effect of, of uh, what we're about to talk about, is that um, some of the A components, uh, 3A, 4A, 5A, can uh, release histamine from uh, mast cells. And mast cells are everywhere in the body. Uh, if you don't remember mast cells, um, they have extremely dense uh, array of very basophilic uh, granules which are released and uh, most of the content of those basic uh, uh, granules is histamine. Most of the um, biologically active content is, is histamine. Histamine then is a pro-inflammatory uh, mediator and uh, causes, among other things, vasodilatation, which of course increases the efficiency by which the polys get to this area. So it, it's part of the healing inflammatory reaction which is being um, orchestrated by complement. Finally, the uh, fourth product is uh, 
uh, for, fourth um, property, sorry, is lytic. And that depends on going all the way past 5 to 6, 7, 8, 9. And all of these are accumulating. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 are accumulating on the membrane when 9 is finally catalyzed by the previous, um, uh, previously activated components. Uh, it forms a transmembrane channel. It's kind of hard to draw 3D on this 2D screen, but something like that. And these are um, these are the evidence, or this is probably some kind of negative stain that shows the, the accumulated structures. And the thing is that um, when this is formed, water can flow through these pores uh, into, the, um, into the interior of the bacteria, and the bacterium swells and bursts, and that's lysis. Okay. So for some, um, for some bacteria, uh, lysis is important. For others, phagocytosis is important, and uh, we'll talk about that last. Um, just uh, one of the things that should be mentioned when we're talking about complement is because complement does have a tendency to spontaneously activate in small amounts, and we don't want that to become a cascade of activation unless uh, you know we're actually uh, doing a, an, an immune defense, we have inhibitors of, uh, of the activation of, of that spontaneous activation. One of them inhibits uh, the, the early activation at C1 level. Um, it, and if people are deficient in this, um, which can either be something they're born with or something that's acquired in, in a way that's not so uh, familiar to us. Um, you can develop a condition called angioedema, uh, in which basically there are uh, episodes where a, a localized um, uh, edema, a very distressing condition, can happen. In this uh, woman's case, the eyelid is swollen, kids' um, lips are swollen. Uh, and um, this is, I mean, it's a, it's a problem as it is, but it can get uh, particularly ugly if the target uh, organ of the, uh, of the edema is uh, something like the uh, larynx. Okay. Uh, because then, of course, you can choke. And um, so this condition is, uh, although it looks just trivial here, uh, can sometimes be very serious and needs to be taken seriously. And there is treatment for it. And it's, uh, that's a whole sort of separate topic. So the um, last point I want to make, going back to the classical pathway activation, we have these, which we know now, uh, cause the, uh, are responsible for the, uh, if we add C3B, uh, are responsible for uh, chemotaxis, are responsible for opsonization, uh, and are responsible for um, anaphylatoxic. And then you have to go all the way up 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to get membrane attack or lysis. So you can uh, plug into this thing um, some of the facts we know about complement practically. For example, um, uh, with some organisms getting um, efficient phagocytosis and killing of the organism is the way that we get rid of that organism. For others, we have to go up to the membrane attack complex because they resist um, phagocytosis or resist phagocytic killing, and so we have to lyse them. Uh, one example of this is the uh, general family of Neisseria which includes Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, both of which are serious diseases. If you can't get up to lysis with those, you don't recover very well from those conditions. You get disseminated conditions, which are very nasty. So you can ask yourself, for example, uh, what if a person were deficient in C6? If you don't have C6, you can activate the early components, and that'll work fine if phagocytosis is what you're about. Uh, but if it isn't, uh, you need to go to C9, and if you're missing C6, you can't go any further. Uh, so there are congenital deficiencies of individual um, uh, complement components. Sometimes we have to measure those, and, uh, and um, you can, uh, in some cases, in any way, get cloned products of those genes to use as a drug to, to treat those people. So that's our brief overview of complement. I hope it helps you understand a lot of biology and... Um, See you later.